Good morning, all. It's good to see you all here this morning. Welcome to Courtsby Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us as we focus here this morning. We gather together to bring glory and honor to our Lord and Savior, the Christ Jesus. Thank you for coming again. I also have a, a special welcome to Ryan Slocum, our guest organist here this morning. Ryan, he serves at the, the org, as the organist at the West Auburn Congregational Church. Ryan, thank you for sharing your God-given gift to us here this morning. Before we continue with the service, just a few more announcements that need to be made here this morning. Today at 11.15, church business meeting. In regards to that, according to our bylaws of the church, um, to read the warrant to you here this morning. To all members of Core Street Baptist Church of Auburn, Maine, 18 years age and over, a special church business meeting will be held today, July 18, 2021, 11.15 a.m., following the morning service in the vestry. After this morning, we'll shoot downstairs for this meeting. The purpose of this meeting shall be to explain six necessary major building projects and their associated costs. Discuss the prudence of church building repair versus relocation in relationship to our mission of seeking God, proclaiming his word, and building his church. Consider establishing a committee to explore options in more detail. Agree to pray for two weeks to hear God's wisdom for this church. And also during the course of these two weeks, we hope that we, you prayed and fasted two times during the course of the two weeks. And plan a follow-up meeting on August 8, 2021. Reverend James H. Grumbine, transitional pastor, Court Street Baptist Church, posted on July 2, 2021. Wednesday of this week, this week at Court Street, prayer meetings 2 at 6.30 p.m. Please look at your bulletin in regards to what it is. Also 10 a.m. Street Ministry. Upcoming events, I would direct your focus on that at some point in time during this day. There's a lot going on July through August. And in the very back page of the bulletin, it's full, a lot of stuff going on, especially ladies' summer conference, vacation Bible school, and a few thank yous from families and members of the church. If you are able, could you stand please for the invocation and the Lord's Prayer. While you are standing, could you please join me in reading of God's word this morning at the very bottom of the page of the service order. I'll read the first verse and would ask the congregation to read the second in response. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. And everyone said, Amen. let's pray. The Father, you are our rock and our salvation. You wrap your rings around us and keep us safe from harm, whatever that harm might be. You are gracious and loving kind, and you are faithful and forgiving. You are what we need in this church individually and corporately. So Lord, we come to you here this morning. Draw nigh to us, your people, for we draw nigh to you, our Lord and our God. We pray all these things in the holy, precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, what in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and a glory forever. Amen. Would you please take your hymnals to number 115. Number 115, Come Christians Join to Sing. May be seated.
Good morning. I'm reading from Joshua chapter 1. It's not an exact parallel, but if we were to uh, look at the congregation of Israel like a church, uh, the senior pastor in the book of Joshua has just uh, died after 40 years of uh, being the senior pastor. His name was Moses. And uh, Joshua, who's been the associate pastor for 40 years, is finally getting his chance uh, as we open chapter 1 of the book of Joshua. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised to Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. <clears throat> be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law, the law always on your lips. You may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, the Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. Your wives, your children, and your livestock must stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan, but all your fighting men ready for battle must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are to help them until the Lord gives them rest as he has done for you and until they too have taken possession of the land the Lord your God is giving them. After that you may go back and occupy your own land which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. Then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you command them will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we're conscious of the fact that uh, our lives are uh, made up of many days and many time periods, some of which you cause us to follow your will in this way, and sometimes of which you cause us to follow your will in some other way. And Lord, we pray that we would be 
as the people of Israel are at the outset of Joshua's ministry, ready to do your will, whatever it is. And Lord, we pray this day as uh, we have gathered that you would be a God of blessing to those of us who are here, uh, to those of us who are not here, that uh, travel or on vacation or aren't well. We pray that you would encourage and lift and strengthen. And Lord, those uh, facing surgeries, those uh, facing bereavement, uh, those facing any other combination of situations that arise in this thing that we call life. We pray that you would give your people strength, that you would give your people encouragement, and that this day, as we've gathered on this uh, rainy July morning, that you would be in charge at Court Street Baptist Church. And Lord, we always hope that. Uh, we want that for every time we gather, for any committee, for any congregational meeting, for any worship service. Lord, we need you. And we pray that you would superintend this meeting as we continue to worship you in it. May our hearts and minds be fully focused upon you and your great grace. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. If you are able, I invite you to stand and take your hymnal for number 237, Lift High the Cross.
You may be seated. I want to echo Dan's welcome to Ryan. As one of the old fogies here at Court Street,
I hope we know how privileged we are to have the music that we do here. Yeah. In the um, spire that's going to come out for August, I tell a story in my part of the, the spire about uh, living in Lancaster County and being in a place where there are churches that don't believe it's right to have instruments in church. And uh, so, you know, they're, they're, those people are sincere in their beliefs, but uh, what a glorious uh, thing to have instruments in church, right? Well, I want to talk about the conquest of Canaan a little bit this morning. And when we talk about the uh, conquest uh, of what the Bible calls the land of Canaan, uh, it involves the potential takeover of Israel, of Jordan, and all the spaces in between in addition to a piece of Egypt, uh, part of Saudi Arabia, Syria, and uh, Iraq. I want to go back to Genesis 15, which we'll soon be looking at in our Sunday evening Bible study as we look at the life of Abraham and his family and the development of uh, the Jewish nation. <clears throat> this is not a very long chapter, but I want to read it in its entirety. Genesis chapter 15. We're going back to the person of Abraham who, who appears just in the last verses of Genesis chapter 11, and his story really begins there and uh, uh, goes much of the way through the Bible. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh, and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Well, God is speaking to Abraham and he's talking to him about uh, the fact that a great nation will come from Abram. The problem is Abraham at this point uh, has no children at all, and he's quite old. Abram believed the Lord, and he, that is the Lord, credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. So you have to understand that uh, in this culture at this time, part of sealing a contract in a very sacred way sometimes involved the cutting of animals in two, sacrifice animals, and putting one part of the animal here, one part of the animal there, and forming a pathway between them. And then the persons in the contract, the persons entering into the contract, would walk between the pieces of the animals. And that would seal the contract as they walked up and down. So watch what happens. Abraham does this at God's request. He 
cuts animals in two, and then he leaves them there, and as the day is going on, according to verse 11, birds of prey are coming down on the carcasses, but Abraham drives them away. Verse 12, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. Of course, God is talking to Abraham about his descendants who will be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, and they will be brought out by a deliverer named Moses. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking firepot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergashites, and Jebusites. So we have here in the early chapters of Genesis the contracting, the covenanting that God is doing with Abraham about his descendants. And he's already talking to Abraham, not just about the next several decades, but he's talking to him, to him about hundreds of years in the future, in which a deliverer named Moses will lead the Israelites out of Egypt at the age of 80. And he'll lead them and they'll wander in the wilderness for 40 years until all of the people who were old enough to follow God but didn't follow God died and a young generation went into the promised land. So fast forward to Joshua chapter 1 and that's where we are. Moses has died at the age of 120 and Joshua, who is no longer a young man himself, has been given the reins of uh, Israel and he's going to lead them across the Jordan River to the city of Jericho, to the city of Ai, and then to all of the city-states within the region of Canaan. And Joshua's job for the next 30 years will be to advance Israel into the place that they're all going to settle and they're going to settle down in the land of Canaan. Uh, sadly, they don't quite complete the job so that there will be some enemies left. And of course, that's another sermon. They left some enemies behind and did not get rid of everyone they were supposed to get rid of. But when we come to the subject of the conquest of the land of Canaan by the Israelites, we have to be honest about what the Bible says and to say up front that the commission that God gave Israel regarding conquest of these peoples who were already living in the land of Canaan amounts in many people's minds who are critics of the Bible to genocide. A genocide is the wanton destruction of a group of people because they uh, do not live up to the particular standard or follow the same religion uh, that uh, the group that wants to destroy them follows. Uh, they are people that are perhaps ethnically different 
or somehow culturally different. And so one group of people wants to come into a land to occupy it and to eliminate another group of people. So there are genocides that have happened all throughout history. Of course, the, uh, one, of the, one of the most famous ones, of course, is uh, the, the Third Reich's desire to destroy Judaism from the face of the earth uh, because of their philosophy and their, their political aspirations. But when we look at this, we see Israel about to go into the land of Canaan, and they are given a task. The task is destroy the Canaanites. Destroy them all. And as we look at the, uh, at the story closely, uh, that's what we see their job was. Now, from a Christian standpoint and from a biblical standpoint, this is a sovereign choice of God. We're not making excuses, and our modern sensibilities being what they are, we have to understand that God is sovereign. People live or die because God permits them to. If there is a judge who has made a heaven for the righteous and a hell for the unbelieving, that God, who has all power, who has created the universe, gets to make sovereign choices that we may not necessarily approve of or even think are fair. But it's not up to us to decide for God what is right and what is not right, what is just and what is not just. What God ordered Israel to do is not a genocide because that would imply that Israel had decided to do it on their own simply because they were Israelites and they want to destroy Canaanites. It's not genocide because if we believe God's version, and the, that version's in this book, the reason was divine judgment. What God is saying to Abraham in one of his first encounters with Abraham back in Genesis 15, which we've just read, he said, I'm going to bring your people back here to this land where you are right now after several hundred years, and I'm going to settle them in this land. The reason I'm not doing it right now is because the evil of the Amorites is not complete. In other words, the people in the land of Canaan, though evil, had not filled up all the evil that they were going to fill up before God throws them out and before God eliminates them under uh, the leadership of Joshua. So we see God's version uh, the reason that God is going to have Joshua bring Israel in and exterminate the Canaanites is God's judgment is ready. The people are idolatrous. They serve demon spirits. Their society is full of sensuality and sexuality. They have idols that they have furnaces inside, idols made of iron and metal, and they heat these iron, these iron idols up to a red-hot heat, and then they sacrifice infants in the hands of those idols. It's a horrible culture that has come up to here on God with its evil. And when Joshua is ready to lead Israel in, that's what the people are doing in the land to which they are going. God judged that they were wicked enough to exterminate at that point. Now, God had done that before. You know, we have the story of the flood earlier in the book of Genesis. God had also provide, promised never to destroy the whole earth again, but God is still going to bring judgment upon certain nations that follow 
the worst kinds of evil. That does not make me feel particularly confident about living in the United States these days. The judgment, at least the brunt of it under Joshua's leadership, would be spread out over about 30 years. It was a long campaign, and even when it was generally ended, Israel still faced many moments of danger from the neighbors that were left. Now, looking at the conquest of Canaan from the positive side, and uh, biblically, and from God's point of view, there is a positive side. God, through the empowering of Israel for advancement, gave Israel 30 years of military glory and expansion and gave them the land flowing with milk and honey that he promised them. There did come a day when Israel rested from battle. And God gave them the land that flowed with milk and honey that he had uh, used metaphorically to describe uh, this wonderful place. But the preparation was long, and it came at a cost. When we pick up the book of Joshua and read it, we perceive a scenario that almost seems to uh, contain a forward momentum that's unstoppable. If you read through the, the five books of Moses, uh, you see Israel getting in trouble with God over here, repenting, and getting in trouble with God over there and repenting. And, it, it, and, and finally God has had enough and he says they're going to wander for 40 years and they go round and round and round in the Sinai Peninsula and in what we call uh, the country of uh, Jordan today, southern Jordan, and it's wilderness and it's dust and it's crushed rocks and it's scorpions and it's vipers, and it's just not a fun place. But looking at the conquest of Canaan from the positive side, God is going to give them, finally, the place that's arable, where crops will grow, where they can settle down and raise their children. He's going to give them a land that was promised long ago to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. When we get to Joshua, as I was saying, it almost feels like Joshua's ready to move Israel at breakneck speed. They come roaring across the Jordan River, the river parts. They defeat Jericho after seven days. Uh, they have a little setback at Ai, but then they defeat Ai, and they just keep coming and they just keep coming. It feels like Joshua was just unstoppable. Well, God, in fact, said, I'm going to pretty much make you unstoppable. What a motivated guy, high energy. He's a spiritual man. He's been Moses' right-hand guy. But the reality is Joshua has been in preparation for over 40 years. Joshua was born into slavery while Moses was out tending sheep in the Sinai Peninsula. Joshua has experienced slavery in Egypt. Joshua has seen the plagues. When Moses came into town with his brother Aaron and the plagues started falling on Egypt, frogs and locusts and hail and uh, fire along the ground and all of the stuff that happened because God brought plagues and punishments on Egypt. Joshua was there. He experienced that. Joshua was one of the Israelites who killed the Passover lamb and put its blood above the doorpost and on both sides of the door and ate the Passover lamb with their bags packed ready to go because God promised them they're getting out of town. Joshua was there. He had followed Moses out of lovely, fertile Goshen, where the Israelites lived and where the crops grew in the Nile Peninsula, or the, the Nile Delta. And he had helped Moses by leading Israel in its early battles out in the wilderness when Israel was soft and untrained slaves 
and they had to be hardened by God in the wilderness and Joshua led the Israelites in those early battles under Moses' direction. Joshua had followed Moses part way up Mount Sinai when God gave Moses the law. Moses said, follow me, Joshua, and he took elders of Israel, and he took Joshua, and the elders of Israel went a third of the way up the mountain. He told them, you stay here. And he took Joshua another third of the way up the mountain, and he said, you park yourself here. And then God, and, and then God met uh, Moses all the way on the top. But Joshua is two-thirds of the way up the mountain while Moses is receiving the law. And he had witnessed the debacle of the golden calf happening down in the valley. Joshua had seen that. He had been sent on an espionage mission with uh, 11 other spies, and he had seen the land of Canaan as a spy. He served Moses as his aide during 40 years of forced wandering. And he was commissioned finally to lead Israel forward following the death of Moses. God had hardened Joshua. He had prepared Joshua. But it didn't happen overnight. He didn't rush in and defeat Jericho overnight. He didn't defeat Ai overnight and all the rest of the land of Canaan. It started out in the slave camps in Egypt over 40 years earlier and God grew Joshua up piece by piece and hardened him bit by bit and battle prepared him for what was about to happen. Israel had experienced 40 years of hardening and learning to fight. Joshua was part of that. Israel had learned to depend on God for everything in the wilderness. Food coming down during the night and being there in the morning. Water when there was going to be water. Shade by day, defense by night. Israel had learned to depend on God for everything. They had learned to pray and worship, to follow with cooperative spirits, Canaan conquest didn't happen in a moment. Israel had to meet God and be serious first. And as we live our lives, uh, God hardens us and he develops us and he makes us more like Jesus and he uses this experience and that experience and he builds us. And he gets us to the point where... Uh, we sometimes get to an age where we can't do some of the things that we used to do, but spiritually and emotionally, he's prepared us to do something else. Whatever he calls upon us to do in that particular day. Consider the fact that God had prepared both Moses and Joshua for most of their lives. For most of their lives, neither one of them starts leadership till they're or full leadership till they're about 80. Moses spent 40 years as a, a shepherd in the wilderness after he spent 40 years growing up in Egypt. And he starts to lead Israel at age 80 and he leads Israel for 40 years. And then he dies and then Joshua takes over who was a bit of a younger man but not that much younger. Moses was 80 years old when God sent him to get his people out of Egypt. And Joshua grew up as a slave until Moses led him out some years later. And 40 years after that, Joshua got to actively lead Israel in, in the fullest sense of the word. Now, what's the point? It's just this. Wherever we are in our life, There are some very young people in the room, right? As young as 19. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody younger out there. And then there's uh, just a couple of us that are older, 
than that, right? But it doesn't matter where we are in life. God has used what he has brought us through to this point to lead us to the next point, whatever that is. And sometimes it's a big thing, and sometimes it's just sit still and wait on me until I give you the next instruction. But it, God gives us the power to advance. And there are many Christians, and there are many groups of Christians in churches that look very, very busy. And they're very, very active, and they have a lot of programs happening. But sometimes busyness is just busyness. And sometimes it's empowered by God. And there are churches that do less busy stuff that do more spiritual stuff, if you understand what I'm saying. The only kind of church I want to be part of is a spiritually empowered one, whether it's big or small. I want to experience what God wants me to do. I want to experience power and direction for what God determines he wants me to do. And so the point is, let's seek God for uh, endowment of power, for the giving of his power. We have to wait upon him to bless us. There are days when I know exactly what I'm supposed to do on that day because the Holy Spirit of God is saying, do this. And there are days when I don't. And the best thing for me to do is sit quiet until I do know. True advance comes about because God grants it. God granted Israel the power and the focus and the energy to enter Canaan and defeat its inhabitants. Nothing can stop what God empowers. Likewise, nothing can succeed which God does not empower. Well, that means there's some uncertainty. And that... that kind of puts it on me to, to have to find out what God wants to empower. Exactly. It's called seeking God. It's uncomfortable. It's unnerving sometimes when I don't know the exact will of God. But I look into the book for advice and I come to God for advice, and I say, God, lead. Empower my steps. Help me to know whether to step over here or step over there. Each of us is expected by God to stand ready to serve in any and every way he commands. I like the end of Joshua chapter 1. Now, it's a little strong because they say, whoever doesn't listen to you, Joshua, will be put to death. Okay, I'm not necessarily recommending that. But I am saying this is pretty, this is pretty good. Joshua 1, verse 16, the people answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we'll do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, that's questionable. So we will obey you. They didn't always obey Moses. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. What are they saying? We'll follow you, Joshua. We just, we just need to know that we're following in God's steps and with God's power. And that's what you and I need to do every day of our Christian lives. There are days we will know what to do. And there are days we will know what not to do. And there are days when we won't be sure and we have to wait on God to give us certainty. 
and not just fly by the seat of our spiritual pants, so to speak. We have to know, because what God empowers succeeds. And that's the end. God bless you. If you are able, would you please stand and take your hymnal for number 436, The Solid Rock. 436. Father, we thank you that you were here with us today. And Lord, we pray uh, more importantly that we will always be where you are and that where you are working, uh, we will come alongside and offer ourselves to you for your service. Thank you for each one of these ones who've come today to worship. I pray you bless them, give them safety as they go to their homes, and as the congregation meets to have conversation uh, about its present and its future, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us unity and give us the sense of your purpose in our minds and hearts and spirits. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless you.